I'm here today at Suffolk University with Tom Vales. Tom is a member of the adjunct faculty at Suffolk. Hi, Tom. How you doing? Good. Tom, it's great to have you with us. What do you do here at Suffolk University? I'm the laboratory coordinator in the electrical engineering department. What sort of things does that involve? I keep all the electrical labs in shape for the students, buying uh, instruments, parts, sending stuff out for repair if it's broken, plus I, you know, also teach the lab. And uh, we'll have students up to my shop at home showing them how to build things as well. I see. I know that you've had a lifelong interest in technology, electricity, and all things science. You have a lot of stuff here today. Uh, what do you have to show us? You're going to get a demonstration uh, of properties of the electron. You're going to see uh, high voltage phenomenon, uh, how power is generated, and even how some uh, medical devices were made using some of this technology. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to watch what I touch <laughs> and uh, let it rip. Well, f first thing is, Mankind's first brush with electricity started in prehistoric times in the form of lightning. And it must have been terrifying because prehistoric man had no scientific background or reasoning to explain what these bolts were doing, shooting out of the sky, uh, setting things on fire, causing trees to blow up. In time, they got used to it, but we're probably still scared of it. So now we're going to jump ahead quite a bit to about 1150 AD, where man started working with something called static electricity. Now I'm sure everyone out there has had a run-in with static electricity. You scuff your feet across the rug in winter, or you pet your dog, and then you go to touch a door handle and a spark jumps. That is static electricity. So mankind was working with that. And then in 1750, a famous man who did an even more famous experiment, Benjamin Franklin, flew a kite in an electrical storm. And he was trying to prove if static electricity was the same thing, or if lightning was the same as static electricity. Now, the story goes that Franklin did draw a spark from the key at the end of his kite string to his, his other hand. If he had gotten a direct hit on the kite from a lightning bolt, that would have been it for Mr. Franklin, okay? But he just picked up a static charge, enough to make a spark jump. So Franklin did this really important experiment. It was quite foolish to do it because people in France were doing it and some of them died. Now Franklin was also an experimenter and he was an inventor and he invented the bifocal glasses. He invented the lightning rod and he invented the device I'm going to show you now. This device is called Franklin's bells. Two bells are hanging on metal chains. There is no clapper in these bells, okay? Nothing up your sleeve. Nothing up my sleeve. And there is a ball hanging on a uh, insulated uh, thread between them. So what Franklin would do with this is he would take one bell and he would hook it to a wire antenna going out of his window. The other one he would hook to ground. And you've all heard that expression, ground it, okay? In those days, it was referred to as earth ground, and it was basically jam a rod into the earth, and that was, that was your ground. Mm -hmm. So Franklin would do this. Now, we don't have a storm cloud floating around up here, so I'm going to use this machine to simulate the storm cloud. This is called a Wimshurst static generator, which was used in laboratories for generating high voltage, and it was much, some made much, much bigger than this, up to maybe four feet across. So, Is that the name of a person? Yes. Yeah, okay. that's, a, that's a good point because um, a lot of times 
when you are talking about, and you will hear me put a name to some of these devices, typically in science, you know, whether it be astronomy, biology, chemistry, physics, there are, are uh, devices, there are postulates, there are theories, there are other, other things, devices, that are named after the person who developed it or who worked with it. Okay, so that's, Mr. Wimshurst made this. Now, I'm going to just crank this up without hooking it up to the uh, Franklin's Bells just to show you, get a spark to jump here. This machine will put out almost two inches of spark. I don't want to touch that. No, door. no, you don't. Okay. Not unless you want your hair curled. <laughs> All right, so I'm discharging it. Now I'm going to hook up Franklin's bells. The other wire goes down to a ground. So this is simulating a thunderstorm outside? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep, that's exactly what this is doing. Sometimes it takes a little to get it to ring. What you are looking at and what you've just had a demonstration of is the world's first early warning electrical storm device, 1750. <laughs> and this is still, I mean, this is a, still a good thing to do today mm -hmm. if, if you want. Have you ever tried this oh, yeah. at your house? Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. It works. Yeah. Uh, this is effectively converting electrical energy to mechanical energy. Well, yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's, it's using... There, I could go into an explanation about how that ball moves back and forth, but it w would take too much time, mm -hmm. and, and it would, wouldn't necessarily be as simple as it should be. So w uh, we'll move to the next okay. uh, thing. Um, oh, speaking of lightning, okay? I just brought this along for uh, a demonstration. It's, it looks like a snake, and it's kind of brittle and has a glassy luster to it and a hole through it. This is called a fulgurite. This is what happens when lightning hits sand. It goes through the sand, the heat of the lightning, we get glass from mm -hmm. sand, from silica. It fuses it. That The lightning put the hole through it, and then it took it and it and it froze it. Wow. Wow. They're they're uh th very they're light. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, very but they're light. they're very rare and they're also very brittle. Mm -hmm. But okay. what I want to talk about next is that there is a particle that without we would not have any electricity. None. No AC, no DC, no static electricity, nothing. It's a very small particle. It only weighs about 9 times 10 to the minus 31 power grams. That's 31 zeros to the right of the decimal point, okay? That is so small, it's inconceivable. Now, can it move? Oh, it can move. It can move up to the speed of light, speed of light in a vacuum. Uh -huh. you know, in other substances, it, it slows right down. So we have those two properties, and if it can move and if it has mass it can do work. The important thing is it has a negative charge and it's called an electron and they're everywhere. Every atom has electrons and if we did not have electrons we would not have electricity. So I'm going to demonstrate now on this tube. This is called a, a Crookes radiometer. It is named after Sir William Crookes, who was an early pioneer in science. What I can tell you about it is, you can see it has a four-bladed propeller in it. Mm -hmm. And it's pivoting on a needle point bearing, so there's very little friction. But the important thing, all these tubes the same, the air is pumped out. So they're in a vacuum. They're in a vacuum, and the reason for that is that electrons can go through a vacuum a lot easier than they can go through air. Mm -hmm. They can go through air, but look at lightning. That takes mm -hmm. a whole lot of force. And going through air, they'd be hitting other oh, atoms. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Molecules, yep. Molecules that are much bigger. Yep. I'm going to 
hook this up to this device, which is called an induction coil. I'm just going to say this. This was an early way of making high voltage for the laboratory, okay? Uh, this one puts out about 75,000 volts. Okay. And, uh, you know... What's powering that? Batteries. Okay, batteries. Yep. Six volts batteries. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to put your hands across that. It, it's kind of nasty. So I'm going to turn this on, right? We have these two electrodes, and we have this propeller in here. So those are electrons, yep, electrons. hitting those paddles? Yep. They're Cut. going this way. Yep. There's some fluorescent paint on the paddles so that you can see them move. But yeah, it's moving. Right now, I'm going to reverse the direction of the electricity. Oh, I see it reversed. A actually, keep watching. Slow down. Oh, yeah. It takes a while to slow down because there's no friction. So there you are having a close-up of electrons doing work, and you're seeing that as, as close as, as possible. Because you can't photograph an electron, they, they can't see them, but here you're directly seeing work being done. So Now, you couldn't have done that with just the battery because it wouldn't have had the voltage? Oh, right. You needed the voltage yeah, yeah, from yeah, this. Yep. Okay. You, you need, oh, yeah. You need to do that. Um, and this was 75,000 volts? Yeah, about that. Okay. Um, All right. So that's the Crookes radiometer. Mm -hmm. Now. And, and about when was that developed? When, when oh, was? I want to say early 1900s. Okay. Um, all right, now the next tube we have here is called, oh, and in case anybody's wondering why I have these goofy looking wires, it's because that these tubes have, some of them have very delicate connections, so you don't want to put a lot of stress on them with a heavy wire. Mm. All right, so this tube, do those wires get pretty hot? During these no, experiments? actually, no. Actually, they don't. They don't. Uh, these wires would get would get warm. Okay. Coming from the battery. All right. Now, okay. this is called an electron beam deflection tube, and there's a screen in it, and the screen has a coating that will fluoresce in the presence of an electron beam. Now. You will see that on here. The only difference between that beam and a copper wire is that this is going through a vacuum, but it is still, you know, the, the same current and everything. It's just that it's not in a wire form. Mm -hmm. So let me, okay. there's the, the beam. Now I'm going to take a magnet here. And as so I, I see bring, the beam, yep. As I bring bring the magnet back and forth, I'm deflecting the beam. One thing, or, or actually two things, I'll, I'll tell you is this um, process was very, very, very important in this country up until probably well, 15, 10, 15 years ago. It's still important, but every home had a device that made use of the principle that I just showed you. And that is that when you have an electric current going through a wire or even through a tube, you get a, a two for one. You get an uh, a rotating magnetic field around the wire. Doesn't matter if it's your headphone wire, the wire going to your toaster, the w you know any, anything. Electric current generates a rotating magnetic field. So you saw the beam here. What was the device? Oh, the, oh, that, sorry, the television set, the TV. 
The TV used uh, what they call, well, they were uh, uh, semi-electromagnets. They were just the, uh, the wire that were in a unit called the yoke that would be near the back of the tube. Mm -hmm. And that's how they would get the, the electron beam to move up and down side so, to side. So those beams were bent? Oh, yeah. Yep. I see. Yep. Interesting. Now, with plasma TVs and all that stuff, we don't need that technology, but it's used in other things. I see. Um, so you have a rotating magnetic field around the electricity, and you okay. saw that yep. interact with the, uh, with the electrical mm -hmm. beam. In the old days, when I got started in this, they had what they called the right-hand rule, where you would take a conductor, put it in your hand, and have your thumb pointing in the direction of the current flow, then your fingers would show the direction of the magnetic field. Oh. That was an early, okay. early thing. All right. All right, so we will go to this device here, which I say, to me, it's way more elegant. These look like works of art. You know that a lot of care was uh, put they, into the, they used the construction to, of they used They used to make things that, that actually worked and lasted. You know, I, uh, I have a reverence for, for old equipment. All right, now, this is, this is kind of an odd looking thing. It's a, a glass bulb and it has, you can see, a, like a finger in the center, mm -hmm. which is it, it's so that this can go into it. Mm -hmm. So it's got an electrode up here. It has another electrode down here that's, that goes 360 degrees, a ring. Mm -hmm. And it sets down on this. Now what this is, this is an electromagnet. And an electromagnet is one that you have a core in a, in a coil. When you activate the coil, the core becomes magnetized. When you take the electricity away, the magnetism goes away. This is called a de la Rive tube, and uh, it was named after the Fr uh, Swiss physicist that developed it. All right, now we gotta, we still need the high voltage. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Two, four, six, all right. Just hang, oh, yeah, right. bear with me here a minute. Right. What kind of batteries are in here? Uh, they're two volt lead acid sealed batteries. Mm -hmm. they're, they're great for this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, I am going to energize the high voltage to this, but I am not going to energize the electromagnet, okay? So, okay, you, so you can see there's a discharge here. Now, when I go to activate, act, activate the battery, now it's rotating that way. Oh. Hang on, uh, technical difficulties here. So it's going that way, yeah. and if I reverse either the voltage to the solenoid or the voltage here, now it's going in the other direction. Now again, we have electrons that we're seeing here yep. that are that have around them an invisible magnetic field. Yep. But what this is showing is is when I activate the magnet. The rotating field around the conductor is being played off of. Yeah, I, 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 I love that tube. That tube is one of the best, uh, you know, demonstration devices. Um, well, okay. I have a few more things about magnets, and I have a few things that are gonna, you're going to be shaking your heads about. First thing, though, is we generate electricity in several different ways. Solar cells, fuel cells, uh, wind power, and the like. 
But we also use magnets and electromagnets in generators. We can do this one of two ways. We can move a magnet past a coil of wire or a coil of wire past a magnet, whatever is the easiest to do. So I have a light bulb on the end of this wire and here's just, this is just a spool of wire and this is a stick of magnets. Well, that's like an old-fashioned flash cube. Flash bulb. Flash bulb. Flash yep. bulb. And it, the other th one thing that determines how much energy you're going to get when you generate it is how fast you do it. The faster you move the magnet through the coil, the more current you will get. Now, I'm just going to move this through here very slowly. and nothing happened. So then, what I gotta do is I'm gonna run this through fast. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> you got that? <laughs> the students love that. Anyway, all right, I have some other things related to magnets. Well, I'm blinded now. <laughs> um, no, but I, you're still talking. So, so that current was generated by you have a coil, yeah, and you pass the magnet through that yep. coil that generated the electricity. Yep. Yep. Some electrons did their thing. Yep, there you go. And blinded me. Yes. Okay. So at least you know why you can't see. All right. <laughs> I have some shrunken coins that are here that uh, I have friends that have devices they built to shrink coins using a very, very high intensity magnetic field, okay? And it just takes the metal and it, it just squashes it in and it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change density, composition, nothing. It just makes it a little fatter, a little less big. And there's some great YouTube videos I was watching of one of your uh, colleagues um, that demonstrates yep. um, this. It's, it's really something to see. Something along a similar line did this pinch waste to the soda can. Put a, a large piece of wire one turn around here and then discharge a lot of energy into it. And quite honestly, they use this principle in manufacturing. They call it magnetic crimping. Sometimes when you can't get uh, metal things to go together, they can, they can use <coughs> electricity to crimp them. Interesting. And what's that for force called that does that? Lorentz force, I okay. believe. Um, Lorentz. And, and th that, too, is named after a person? Yep. Okay. Um, there are also some magnetite crystals here, as they are found in nature. Now, those are out of the ground. Those, yeah, magnetite. those are out of, out of the ground. Yeah. Um, That's a great crystal. Um, there is a mineral called magnetite. It is nature's magnet. You can find it in a lot of places. You can dig it up and it will come up magnetized or it will come up non-magnetized. It just depends where it was mm -hmm. formed. This one, as you can see, is magnetized. It's got all the little iron filing hairs mm. all over it. But I'll give you uh, <coughs> what early man did once they found this, oh, by the way, if it's magnetized, it's referred to as lodestone, mm -hmm. uh, L-O-D-E, lodestone. Um, and it Is does have poles. It has a north pole. It has a south pole. Okay, fairly dense. Yeah, yeah well, what fairly they used dense. to do on ships is they'd take a piece of this, and they knew where the poles were. They put it in a non-metallic basket and hang it from a string in front of the pilot of the ship. And they would watch that, and that would move just, you know, to north, just like a compass. But they had, there was a rock. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you get on an airplane and they got a rock hanging in the cockpit, get your money back. Okay, now we're going to do another thing with magnets. I noticed, Tom, that there's a lot of copper involved in all these experiments. What's the, what's the attribute of copper? It's a good conductor of electricity. Okay. It's one of the best, and it's the most affordable. 
because gold, silver, and those metals would be, you know, way out of reach. I and see. it's aluminum is a conductor, but it's not as good a conductor. Okay. Now, this is the, uh, I believe this is the last thing in magnets. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a piece of copper pipe, okay? Bought it at Home Depot. It's, it's a half inch uh, ID. Totally, you know, nothing bogus here. And here I have a magnet. <clears throat> and this is what's called a rare earth magnet. Okay, it's, these have been coming into their own. They've been around 10, 15 years, I think. How heavy is that? It's fairly... That's fairly dense. Yep. Now, copper is not magnetic, mm -hmm. as you can see. So, when I take this and drop this through the tube, how fast do you think it's going to go? All right, we'll start counting. Here we go. One might expect it to just come straight out. Yeah. Well, there's an explanation for this. You can't do this with an ordinary magnet. You need a rare earth magnet because it has the density of, it, of its field. But what's going on here, remember I s said you move a magnet through wire or wire past a magnet, you generate a current. Well, this magnet, when it's going through the tube, it's generating a current oh. in the tube. Mm -hmm. Now, a current has a rotating magnetic field. So that current is generating a rotating magnetic field in opposition to the motion of the magnet. So that's why the magnet just goes down. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, the, they're called eddy currents, and uh, I'm not going to go into an explanation of that because it, it's too many, too much physics. So, so had you not used a magnet, then gravity would have. Oh, oh yeah. Just yep. Right. If I put a piece of steel in there, yep. it would have shot right through. I see. So oh, that's neat. That yeah, that's. I like that's that one. Neat. It's a good head sh head scratcher. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, Tom, this has been. Um, Shocking, to say the least. I had to use that term. Uh, and also blinding. Uh, you know, we've seen some intriguing experiments uh, with magnets, with the electron, and these various devices. Now, I know you have some real hair-raising stuff, but that's going to be in our next show. So I want to thank you all for watching, and... We'll see you at our next show.